10.03, I know we'll have a few more people. People are still joining us. Um, but let's go ahead and get started. And my name is Kevin Mather. I'm the president of the World Trade Center in Northern California. And it's really a pleasure to have you all join us today. Um, this is one of three sessions that we're doing in partnership with the Northern California SBDC. They are our funding partner, which is enabling us to bring this content to you. And it's about really providing education, resources, and connections for businesses here in Northern California that are doing or want to do international business. Uh, last week, we did one on STEP grants, uh, state trade expansion program grants to help people to expand their exporting. And today, we're going to be talking about importing. And we've got a, a fabulous presenter with us that we'll get into in just a second. Coming up at the end of October, and I'll put the link into the chat window, we'll be doing a third webinar, which will be the fundamentals of international e-commerce. E-commerce, cross-border e-commerce, has absolutely exploded over the last few years. And it's a great way for businesses to be able to expand their sales and access new customers, whether it's business to business or business to consumer. So like I say, I'll put that third link in the, uh, the chat window. We have left plenty of time for Q&A at the end of the session. So if you do have questions, if you'll please put them into the Q&A, you should see that at the bottom of the screen. And then we'll take those questions at the end. With that, I'd like to introduce um, our speaker, uh, Deep San Gupta. Deep is the founder and chief executive officer of DSG Global, a firm that provides consulting advice to small and medium-sized companies on import and export regulations. Prior to founding DSG Global, Deep managed FedEx Trade Consulting Group for over a decade, where he assisted over a thousand companies with international trade issues. Prior to that, Deep was with KPMG in Asia. Deep obtained his initial legal education in India, arrived in the US for his master's in law taxation from the University of Washington, and received executive education on international trade from Harvard University's Kennedy School of Government. And Deep is also a licensed customs broker. We're really lucky to have him with us. And he was recently honored to receive the President's E Award for Export Service, which is the highest award that's given for export promotion. And with that, I'd like you to all welcome Deep. And Deep, I'll turn it over to you. Kevin, thank you for the kind introduction. I, I really appreciate it. And I'm so excited uh, to speak with um, uh, you know, all of you today. Um, I, um, I've been a big fan of the World Trade Center of Northern California, Kevin, under your leadership. And I really appreciate the SVDC for uh, making this a reality by, uh, you know, uh, these trade programs. Friends, um, I'm going to pull up my uh, slides. Uh, just a second. Okay. All righty. So today we're here to talk about the fundamentals of importing. And, um, you know, we thought we'd keep it to under 40 minutes so we can have time for Q&A. Now, importing is a big topic. So um, what I've done is um, I've provided a lot of slides, which will be a good resource for you all later on. But uh, I'm going to go through them fairly quickly to give you a comprehensive understanding of uh, you know, the issues involved in importing, the risks, best practices, what to be aware of, all right? So uh, that's the agenda. Um, the roles of customs, it's called Customs and Border Protection. That's a primary government agency that manages imports. There's also PGA, other participating government agencies. Many other government agencies play a role food and drug, U.S. wildlife, you know. Uh, CHB, which is a customs house broker, which is really your agent for clearing the goods. And you, who is the IOR, the importer of record. There's tons of acronyms in my field, so uh, <laughs> uh, bear with me. We'd also talk about the import process. You could be a one person, um, you know, importing, um, uh, let's say um, artifacts from South Africa, you just use US Post. You might, um, uh, you know, be a smaller business uh, that prefers air shipments, and you've got FedEx, Express Carriers, UPS, DHL. 
or you could be a big importer um, in terms of a small company, but uh, or medium-sized company, but you know, a lot of your raw materials come from overseas. So you need to have a little more robust import plan. And that's called formal entries. We've talked about that too. Then we're gonna be talking about some common issues or risk factors when you import. One is getting your classification number right, getting your customs valuation right. What are the marking and labeling requirements? Record keeping is critical. Number seven is penalties. I hate to spoil your lunch, but uh, you know, it, it would be irresponsible if I didn't tell you that uh, there are significant penalties for getting it wrong. Reasonable care. Ideally, what are the best practices for creating a good import compliance program? I'm also going to be talking about a couple of latest developments that you all need to know about. And then we'll jump into the Q&A. Well, the roles of customs and the other agencies. Now, Customs and Border Protection was the oldest government agency that uh, started collecting revenue uh, way before the Civil War. Uh, and uh, US Customs Service remained part of the Treasury Department for over uh, 200 years until the tragedy of 9-11 and the attack on the United States 20 years ago. At that time, Customs was put under the Department of Homeland Security, the newly created and it was merged with border protection. So all of a sudden, customs job is no longer to just collect customs duties, but is also to guard and protect uh, all the borders of the United States from weapons of mass destruction and other threats. There are many other government agencies, we call them PGAs. In the past, they used to be known as OGAs, other government agencies that have some rules uh, covering uh, international trade and imports. I'll just read down the list. FDA, if you come into the United States with plants and fruits uh, or medicines or medical devices, uh, you know, fish and wildlife, Department of Agriculture, Department of Transportation, if you get in motors and motor, motor vehicles, uh, consumer product safety. We, we used to hear in the past about, uh, you know, certain kids' toys or uh, that had um, a paint with uh, some chemicals that were injurious to the health. So that's where consumer protection comes into place. So you'll see, uh, depending upon your commodity, there could definitely be more than one government agency that has jurisdiction. Now you are the importer of record. Unless you uh, tell the express carrier to import the goods under their bond, you are, in all other cases, the importer of record and fully responsible for the import formalities, paying the customs duties, and complying with US law. Now, you could pass that role on to your customs broker, who is... Um, uh, you know, a U.S. entity that's taken a very tough exam and their job is that of trade facilitation. A customs broker will always ask you, may I have a signed power of attorney, right? And that's what they do. And um, it's very important to check uh, every now and then how many of brokers you have who've been clearing goods on your um, account, even though you might have forgotten that some people uh, sign the power of attorney. So you can always ask for a freedom of information request or look at your automated commercial environment account, your ACE account. So that's what a custom broker does. <clears throat> a freight forwarder is similar. They move goods from A to B and many a time they also provide the custom brokerage function. So what is the import process? Like I said, there's different types of importers. You could be traveling in uh, Turkey and say, wow, I really like this brass lamp. And you just want to get a brass lamp. In that case, you know, if you come to me and say, Deep, uh, how do I import this? 
I'll say, you know, just use the postal service. It might be really simple. But then, um, and you know, there's different type of customs entries. It could be uh, section 321, which is your carrier just is the importer. If it's less than 800 bucks, I'll say it's de minimis. You don't have to pay customs duty on those kind of clearances. Just bring it in US Post uh, or FedEx, but it's, you know, express carriers are more expensive. But if you say deep, you know, I really like this and um, I want to buy 10 of these um, lamps from Turkey and give it to all my friends at Christmas. So I'll say, well, you know, uh, it might still be an informal entry if it's less than $2,500 in value. So um, go the informal route and, you know, maybe you could use a FedEx, DHL or UPS. And you know, DHL is strong in, Asia, in uh, Europe. But if you say deep, I love these lamps and my friends love these lamps. Guess what? I'm going to get into the business of importing lamps. Then I'm going to say, okay, all your future shipments most likely are going to be formal entries. It, it might be more than $2,500 for that big uh, pallet, right? So uh, that kind of explains the evolution of the different types of entries. So if you're a small mom and pop, you're most likely not doing a formal entry. But as you get into doing it on a commercial basis, yes, most of the uh, small, medium-sized companies would definitely be doing, and of course, large companies would be doing formal entries. Now, suppose you want to expand this deep, you know what? It was a hit in the United States. Now I want to go global. And I'm going to start with Canada. Uh, but, you know, so you bring your items in uh, into the port of L.A. Long Beach, but you want to ship it out of the port of Detroit by road into Canada. Then you will do an in-bond entry. So your goods will move uh, from port to port under bond. So those are the different types of customs entries I thought I'd explain to you. What happens is um, now we're talking formal entries. After you make an entry, which is your customs broker tells the government, there's a CF 7501, which is customs form 7501. And they tell the government, uh, you know, uh, this shipment's coming in. Uh, then you've got to provide the entry documents and pay duty. Usually after a year, we say the entry is liquidated. You can't make any other change. Uh, but you are allowed to do a protest 90 days after the products, your entry liquidates, which is usually, as I said, one year after you bring the goods in. Uh, there's also, um, if you want to uh, challenge anything customs might have done in terms of the classification, the duty paid, there's also a legal route. As I said, you can go to the Court of International Trade, and then you can go to the Federal Court of Appeals, so on and so forth. That's the process. But what I always tell my company, uh, my clients is, uh, please try to get it right the first time. So you don't have to do the amendments, the post-entry adjustments and the protest, right? These are the documents that you've got to provide along with your shipment within 10 days of arrival. Commercial invoice, that's the biggest. If you've got many different items together, we suggest a packing list, right? It's like your recipe for the goods. Okay, this is what all the things that's in this omelet. Right? <laughs> so it's your packing list of uh, the different commodities in your shipment. Bill of lading and carrier manifest just to show proof of ownership. And depending upon your product, your broker might say, oh, it's a medical device. It needs additional FDA form, right? So uh, there are um, different supporting documentation, depending upon your product. But the commercial invoice is the most important because that's what customs officials will look at and they'll decide whether to hold your shipment for a few days for an intensive exam or for more information or to just let it go. And uh, usually this is the information a commercial invoice should have. A commercial invoice is what is almost like a balance sheet where, you know, some accountants, they say they can look at a balance sheet and tell all about the company. 
I, I don't have that insight, but if you do uh, this business long enough, you can look at a commercial invoice and figure out exactly what the transaction is about. And if there are any key terms missing, you know, customs is going to hold the shipment. So you need to know the name and address of the buyer, the shipper. You need to have a detailed description of the merchandise, the quantities, the foreign currency involved, country of origin, right? And these are a list of common invoice errors. I, I, I don't want to get into this too much, but I, I've seen companies get the country of origin wrong, failure to convert a foreign currency, which gets very expensive if you're importing in yen or lira, right? Uh, using part numbers instead of a complete description. And, you know, I, I don't want to read the slide, but suffice it to say that your invoice should be complete, legible, and consistent. By consistent, don't have some information on one um, invoice and have your packing list with other information. Once customs looks at your paperwork, they will obviously check if the harmonized code you provided is correct and will assign a customs duty rate. Uh, there's also a merchandise processing fee for ocean shipments uh, and air. Uh, there's a harbor maintenance fee only for ocean. Uh, which uh, could go up to its 0.34 of uh, percentage of the entry with a cap at $538 per entry. Customs would want you to have a customs bond if you're the importer of record. And there are many bond companies. You could also have your own bond or a single entry bond or a continuous bond. And the amount of bond uh, that you need to have, it's, it's almost like, a, do you have cash reserves in order to cover the duty rate for these items you're importing? That's really what a bond is. And if you don't have the money, you pay a bond to a company which says that they will take care of the customs duties if for some reason you can't uh, pay for it. Uh, if you're importing by ocean, a couple of years back, um, customs started asking for this importer security filing data on every ocean shipments. So ahead of time, before your goods arrive in the USA, actually, um, you've got to, uh, before they leave the foreign port, you've got to provide the name of the buyer, your importer of record number, like tax ID, country of origin, HDS, and where uh, in the ship your item is located, your container, it's called the vessel store plan. A lot of information, and this really has to do with US customs getting better data. So if there's something that goes wrong in the supply chain, you know they know whose shipments cause that, or uh, customs can also identify any suspect or suspicious shipments, which they can uh, kind of, um, inspect before it arrives at the shores of the United States. One of the key compliance areas is HTS classification. And the reason it's so important is that it determines your customs duty rate. Uh, harmonized tariff classification. Um, don't ever try to download uh, this schedule. It's 3,000 pages long, but it's divided into 99 chapters. And each chapter contains a different commodity. And um, there are 10 digits uh, in the harmonized tariff schedule for any product. Suppose you import a glass made of glass. Um, then um, the, you know, the first two digits will be the category. The next two digits will be the heading. The next two digits will be the sub subheading. And then the last four digits are called the statistical suffixes. And based on the government's revenue needs or uh, individuals' lobbying efforts, there are different customs duty rates for all the different HDS codes. So obviously, um, you should not try to choose the lowest or duty-free code. 
you should try to choose the code that's correct and most accurate for your product. And you can do that by obviously consulting an expert or researching previous rulings that customs has given importers. There's a website called CROSS. It stands for Customs Rulings Online Search System. So I could look up Glass Tumblr uh, and see if customs has provided any similar rulings in the past. And if uh, it's one product, um, you know, this lamp, uh, we, you don't know if it's a decorative piece, you don't know if it's an antique, or you don't know if it's just an item or brass, uh, right? <clears throat> or a candle holder, all have different codes. So you can request a binding ruling from customs. Uh, like I said, these are the different categories uh, some of the categories that Customs has uh, provided. So you will select your product. And this is a snapshot of, uh, you know, just an um, article of a clothing accessory, a belt made of reptile leather, crocodile skin. I'm sorry, I'm all about uh, PETA and animal rights, but this is just an example. So you will see that the heading is uh, chapter 42, it's uh, articles of apparel. And 4203 is articles of apparel made of leather. And then 4203.30 is belts. And uh, with or without buckles, but um, um, you know, other clothing accessories made of leather would be dot 40 of reptile leather would be 4203.403000. So that's the 10 digit HTS code of an article of apparel of reptile leather uh, that is um, not a belt. You know, it could be like a, uh, a small purse or something. And the there are three different uh, HS uh, columns here. The one that's most applicable to every country is 4.9%. It's called the general or the most, sorry, am I, it's moving. Wow, it's got a mind of its own. Is, is called the most favored nation rate. The free item here with all these alphabets are free trade agreements. Never use a free trade agreement until you know that you are eligible and qualify. Every free trade agreement has a certain eligibility test and we'll talk about that. Number two are from Un unfriendly countries or embargoed countries where it's a punitive customs duty. This could be Russia, for instance, or North Korea. So, you know what? We're going to place a very high customs duty on you. These are the general rules of interpretation. Um, I won't go into it, but basically, if there's several HS codes, the ones that apply must follow this rule of logic. Number one just says, classify goods based on their wording. Now, if there's, um, sorry, there's something wrong with my um, keyboard, but um, okay, maybe it's telling me to hurry up. So these are the different rules. And if you see rule number three says, classifying goods under two different headings, what should we do? Well, then the rule is um, look for specific over general uh, or select the, number later in numerical order. Um, for example, here's a golf bag made of leather. So yeah, I'm having just a little uh, issue with this. It's moving too fast. I wonder, just a second, I will just go back and uh, it's better if I do it in a different way. Okay. Uh, Kevin, uh, can you see it large enough? Yeah. Sorry, I didn't know why uh, it was. Deep, none of us have ever had any technology problems during the last couple of years doing webinars. This is, no, I'm joking. Okay. <laughs> Everybody <laughs> did <didn't laughs> <dance. laughs> so. Then the law of averages got up with me. Okay. So that's how you classify. You choose the golf bags made of leather because this is way more specific than golf clubs 
parts and accessories under chapter 95. So that's why uh, that's um, the logic you've got to go through, uh, following the general rules of interpretation. A customs valuation is uh, very important. Uh, this, you see, you're paying customs duty as a percentage, which is determined by a harmonized code, calculated on the value of the goods. So suppose the customs duty rate for you is 4%, and you, uh, you, know, you wrote in your commercial invoice that your customs value is $100 then the customs duty you pay is $4, right? 4% 4 of 100. But if customs comes back to you and says, you know what, you put down $100 in value, but we think it's $1,000 in value and you're short paying us customs duty. That's why it's very important for you to go through the established rules for assigning value. The Benchmark or the default should always be the transaction value, which is the sales price. But if you do not have a sales price because the items are a discount, they're a sample, they're on a consignment basis or for R&D only, then customs wants you to go through these other uh, methods. One is a transaction value of identical merchandise, transaction value of a similar merchandise. But if you say, you know, my item is so unique, there's no identical or similar goods, then you can either use deductive or computed value. Deductive means your sales price that you sell to your customers minus advertising and marketing costs. And computed value means the cost of the raw materials or the cost of the goods plus a certain profit margin. It can't only be cost. It's going to be cost plus maybe 10% profit margin. Now, if none of these uh, valuation methods meet your goods, then you can use the fallback method of category six, which is you know some other method that you come up with, but you've always got to get a permission from customs. That's what I always recommend. One of my customers brought in scrap. And the value of scrap is, scrap. You only find it out when you burn it in the furnace and then you find out how much precious materials have come out from the scrap um, defective cell phones. So that's where we can use this uh, the last method. Uh, also, if your item is 15 years old and it's fully depreciated, then you can use the last method because there's no other method applicable. So, um, Always check your method of valuation, especially if you get something that's not quite sales price. Uh, you know. Also, I forgot to mention, if you're importing from a related party, like a subsidiary, a group company, a parent company, if that relationship has influenced the price, that means you got it at below market rate, you cannot use transaction value and you've got to go down the other five methods. Uh, let's talk about marking rules. Every product you bring in needs to have the country of origin. The country of origin is not necessarily the country of exportation or where it came from. It's most likely the last country where the item was substantially transformed into its finished state. Now, in this age of a global economy, it's very tough to figure out the raw materials came from Taiwan, did processing in China, did quality check in Belgium, and then it's packaged in Mexico, which is the country of origin. Don't get it wrong. Uh, consult an expert, do your own research, because getting the wrong country of origin and maybe claiming a free trade agreement based on that, you know, is just a red flag for penalties later on. So always ask your broker, we have this unique, we're buying it from China, uh, but it's actually processed elsewhere. And the country of last country of substantial transformation is maybe South Korea. So your broker is in a better position to tell you, well, in that case, the country of origin you should mention is X, Y, and Z. 
I always say for free trade agreements, uh, always check what the eligibility rules are. Uh, your products might come from Korea, but it won't qualify automatically for the US-Korea free trade agreement until it meets that threshold of domestic content. And for that rule, you need to look at the agreement for the US-Korea free trade agreement, okay? That's one area where a customs always um, uh, looks out and scrutinizes. Marking, uh, quite frankly, all products brought into the United States need to be marked with the country of origin so that the US consumer knows what it is. A lot of companies, uh, please don't mark your products with made in USA if it's made substantially with imported components because the Federal Trade Commission really enforces the made in USA mark. There are some marking exceptions. You know, if it's economically prohibitive, if the item is fragile and, uh, you know, incapable of marking. You know, some example examples of exempt items, Christmas trees, how am I going to mark it? Antiques, it'll break. Playing cards, <laughs> livestock. <laughs> now, customs plays an important role in IPR protection. So if you bring in any goods that have a trademark, you've got to be uh, able to back up that, uh, that you have a legal right to import that logo if customs questions you. Now, a lot of logo owners can go to customs and seek protection for their logo by recording their IP, intellectual property, with customs. It could be a trademark, could be a copyright. So if um, you have a product with a logo, I recommend you get it recorded with customs so other people who bring in counterfeits and fake items, uh, their goods will be held up. And if for some reason you, you are planning on getting counterfeit Rolex watches and fake Disney apparel, I just want to warn you, it could be stuck at the border. Sorry, I'm not suggesting anyone on the call is any uh, less than a perfect citizen, but you know, uh, good to know the law. Record keeping. It is a pain, but remember five years is the record keeping rule for all the import documentation, your customs entry, your commercial invoice, you are supposed to keep it for five years. Um, customs is evolving. They know that uh, companies keep it electronically and uh, it's fine if you keep it electronically, it doesn't have to be an exact replica of the paper copy, but it should contain all the data elements. Penalties, friends, Anyone who brings in goods by means of a material false statement, omission, or act, including aiding and abetting, is uh, you know culpable under 19 U.S. Code 1592. And there are three levels of culpability. If you just make a simple mistake, it's negligence. If you make the mistake again and again, or it's pretty egregious then customs goes for gross negligence. But if they know that you've got a criminal intent and you've done it knowingly, voluntarily, and intentionally, then it's fraud. If you know that there are anti-dumping, which I didn't talk about, um, anti-dumping duty is a duty placed on foreign goods where um, let's say US customs knows that it's being sold in the United States at a lower price then in the foreign country itself, then you're dumping. And if there's an injury to US manufacturers because of the importer's dumping, then there's an anti-dumping duty applied in addition to the customs duty. So suppose the anti-dumping duty is on uh, a certain fish product and you're bringing in that fish product, but you mislabel it in order to avoid the anti-dumping. That's clearly a fraud, right? And these are the penalty, uh, you know, twice the amount of duties unpaid or 20% of the value is the penalty for negligence. The lesser of, 
what that means is, um, uh, you know, even if you make uh, an HTS error or a valuation error, which doesn't really change the duty to the government, the government's not going to say no harm, no foul. They will charge you based on the value instead of the duties short paid. And if you just look at fraud, it's 100% of the value of the goods is penalty. So uh, we should all be careful. Now, a prior disclosure allows companies before or without knowledge of a customs investigation, if you tell customs, hey, mea culpa, I confess, I found out that there's a mistake. Here are the full circumstances of the error. And here is the duty of short paid and a check for the interest, then customs will not give you any penalties. That is great. Sadly, on the export side, the, en uh, the enforcement agencies are not as nice. Uh, they do not uh, waive penalties, they give a break. So customs using the prior disclosure, it's kind of like a voluntary disclosure, a confession, but you can only make it before you know that customs has started an investigation on you, right? Uh, so that's a great thing. Uh, uh, many people say, hey, I just found out that we are doing this incorrectly and we've been doing it incorrectly for five years. Shall we just sweep it under the carpet? Shall we just plead ignorance? And the question is, well, what is the probability that customs will find out? If they ever come in for an audit, is it one of the first questions that are going to come up? Well, you know, it's a business decision that you need to make. If it's going to bankrupt your company, you know, take legal counsel advice, right? Uh, but uh, if there's even the slightest chance that customs would find out, using the prior disclosure mechanism can save you all the penalties. Reasonable care. Reasonable care is... Um, term that customs uses, uh, it passed the Modernization Act about 25 years ago, and they said, um, we're going to use the tenets of informed compliance, where uh, customs will expect the importer to be informed of the law. Customs will provide all this information and resources and guidance on our website, which is um, cbp.gov and then you select trade there's a lot of information out there on um, customs formalities guidance informed compliance publications but customs wants the importer to exercise reasonable care it's kind of like common sense and adherence to the law they want all the information reported to customs to be accurate well documented and uh, the importer can't just blame the foreign supplier you've got a duty to investigate the information they give you so um for the larger companies out here i just uh, i'm right up on my 40 minutes for the larger companies i would say anyone that's importing on a regular basis here is how you should set up an import compliance program so customs doesn't hold up your shipments, doesn't send you letters for further information and doesn't send you penalties or call, haul you up for an audit. Uh, here's my top 10 list for setting up an import compliance program. Number one, a formal statement from management, you know, saying we are going to comply with customs laws. Number two, providing training to your team on import regulations. Today was just an introduction, but there's a lot more advanced training. Number three, writing down the process. What if your shipping manager goes on a holiday or wins the California lottery? The backup needs to have the documented plan. Number four, assign HTS numbers for all of your items. Use binding rulings to confirm your harmonized code if there's no prior rulings or you're not sure and if it's a little complicated. 
develop record keeping procedures. Don't say, oh, my broker FedEx will take care of it. A lot of companies do that. And, you know, after a year, if customs ask you for an entry, they'll say, oh, my God, FedEx just told me they're going to charge me for the CD. <laughs> Developing a vendor compliance program probably solves 90% of your headaches. This is a lead, you know, procedures that you can give your foreign supplier say, these are the codes to use, this is the value to use, these are the documents to send along with the shipment, right? Wouldn't that make it easier if all your foreign suppliers followed those instructions? <clears throat> a regular training program so that you can train other members of other departments. Every department has a role to play in customs compliance. And that might be a topic for a future presentation that I have. Formalized audits is always a good thing to uncover errors. And number 10, voluntarily report those errors if you find them. Friends, um, the last slide today is the latest changes. There's a lot going on on the US-China trade front. Up to 25% additional tariff. Uh, we thought President Biden would change what President Trump has done, but it's the same old plan. Customs is going in a big way against forced labor and they're issuing uh, withhold orders, WROs, uh, to prevent any material from forced labor, made from forced labor from entering the country. Most of this comes from China, especially the Uyghur province. But now Customs is saying many, many other countries, and they've said which products, like from India, they've said carpets and tea, could be made of forced labor. Forced labor is not just prison labor. It could be anybody working against their will. And another recent um, uh, program that I'm very excited about is CTPAT trade compliance. It's an addition to the cargo security program called CTPAT, and it provides an exemption from customs audits for anyone who joins the CTPAT trade compliance program. But the prerequisite is you've got to be a CTPAT member, which stands for Customs Trade Partnership Against Terrorism, uh, where you provide details about your cargo security. Friends, that in a nutshell is uh, fundamentals of importing. And I'm delighted uh, to take any questions and answers. And I'd like to offer just a free session to anybody uh, who wants to, uh, me to provide this information to their team. Uh, it's my pleasure to support uh, the SBDC and the World Trade Center in this regard. Kevin, uh, that's it for me. I'd love to answer any questions. Great, thank you very much, Jeep. Um, we've got a couple of questions. Uh, first question was, will a copy of this program be available? Yes, so what I'll be doing is um, I will be sending out a copy of the presentation along with a survey a brief survey that'll ask all of you to fill out along with a link to the video. And that'll go out either later today or tomorrow. Uh, another question was, um, can you share with us progress made to submit transactions for clearance in digital format? Is Customs and Border Protection sharing with you about the type of file format or not? So this is an ongoing um you know, the whole digital uh, FedEx, uh, sorry, Customs has worked very closely with all the express carriers. So there's electronic documentation that you provide and it goes through EDI, <laughs> uh, all these um, acronyms. Uh, but for the, for uh, regular importers that want to send stuff, um, uh, there is, your broker can use uh, the ABI system, automated broker interface. So uh, it's not um, perfect, but it's being used. Um, uh, and there's been a lot of developments in the last couple of years. But currently, uh, what my small to medium sized companies are doing, they're taking their paper documents or electronically sending it to uh, their customs broker, who then punches it in, in that system mm -hmm. that goes straight to customs. Right. Great question. Thanks, Glenn. Great seeing you here. Great. 
Um, you know, so it, it's really interesting. You talked about the HTS codes, and that's those codes that that really define and describe all products used in global trade. Once you've taken and determined the HTS for a product that you're going to import, do you need to go back and check that on a regular basis, or you know, what would be your advice on on managing and monitoring those HTS codes? You know, very often I meet companies and I tell them, you know, this code uh, doesn't look valid. When is the last time you did it? And they say, oh, Stan, our shipping manager, uh, did it five years you know, before he left. <laughs> so what happens is the codes are always changing, at least every calendar year. But every four years, there's a, mi a mini review by the World Customs Organization every eight years there's a, a larger rewrite. And in the larger rewrite, they bring in new technology like drones, <laughs> uh, you know, all the iPods. Uh, can you believe that in the tariff, a computer is still known as an automated data processing machine? <laughs> you know, so it all goes back to the 1960s. So therefore, because of the technology changes and the changes to the tariff, I would recommend that companies at least every four years, uh, check their HS codes for obsolescence. Maybe the codes don't exist. Maybe the codes they're using are wrong codes. Yeah. All right. You know, and just um, for everybody that's uh, uh, that's attending, um, this whole issue of HDS codes or HS codes um, and Schedule B for export, very technical area. If you have any need of assistance with that, please reach out to us. We have excellent um, experts that are available to help you folks like Deep. Um, we did a project last year for a local exporter to review a number of their export codes and found that some of them were also out of date. So this is really good advice. Now, can you use that same HTS code? In other words, multiple countries, let's say you're importing product from multiple countries. Is it gonna be the exact same HTS code from all those countries? If, you're, if you have multiple sources in supply chain for that product, you know, great question. Kevin, I would say 90% of US exporters just use their HS code, which is really a US import number, and they use it on their products being exported around the world, China, India, Brazil. But the truth is, the H in an HTS code is harmonized around the world, harmonized, but it's only harmonized for the first six digits. The last four digits are unique to the destination country. So if you import wine into Saudi Arabia, guess what? They have much fewer digits at the last four digits than compared to France, where you have Petit Syrah, Petit Blanc, Chanel, you know, you know, you have. So what I would recommend is if you know your top export destinations, create a corresponding column for your US codes with the foreign destination codes. And you will see that you are being charged less duty and there's less inspections because the foreign customs officer will see that and know exactly what the product is. Right now, they're seeing your US code and say, well, I recognize the first six digits, but the last four digits I don't recognize. So let me assign the highest custom duty rate. And that's what's happening, sir. Right. And Okay. Um, now, our customs broker says that becoming a CT PAT member will reduce shipment inspections. Is this really true? You know, on an average, I think it's true. Now, your goods could be held up for a very variety of reasons. CT PAT is like a relationship with customs. Uh, it's like getting the green channel treatment. And Customs has said that CTPAD members are seven times less likely to be inspected than a non-CTPAD member. So I would always recommend companies join the program. But if you just import sporadically and imports are less than 25% of your sourcing, then I'd say it's probably not important. But if imports is you know, more than 25%, it's a significant part of your supply chain, then joining CTPAD shows the government that you're partnering, will reduce inspections, and is really <clears throat> a, a precursor to other customs programs 
like the CTPAT trade compliance, formerly known as import or self-assessment, where customs gives you a waiver from uh, customs audit. So uh, I agree with your customs broker here. Okay. Please join if you can. A uh, couple more questions. We've got time for just a couple more. If you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A for us. There are a couple more. It says, I'm a small importer. Am I at risk for a customs audit? You could, you know, I call it the Wesley Snipes uh, syndrome. Uh, forgive me, I love Wesley Snipes. But he got a big um, tax penalty and audit from IRS. And what I tell people is, um, I haven't yet got it, touch wood, but uh, as an, an audit from the IRS, but it usually happens to people with deep pockets, right? Right. It doesn't happen to people like, you know, me and my neighbors, you know, friends of mine. So what I would, rec what I tell people is if you're importing more than $10 million in value, you're in the top 9,000 importers in the USA. If you're importing more than $30 million in value, you're in the top 1,000 importers. That's when you should really focus on the possibility of a customs audit. For the rest of us, customs will do a single issue audit only if we've got a history of mistakes in our imports. If we're always bringing in the wrong code, we're always bringing in the wrong value, customs are going to say, you know, let's do a, a, a single quick response audit uh, on this small company. But generally, it's for uh, the ones with the deep pockets. <laughs> uh, right. no you know, and on this point, really, um, especially for the smaller importers and exporters out there, there's a host of resources and experts that can help you navigate this quickly, cost effectively, to make sure that you are in compliance and that international trade is easier for you. That's really what, you know, what DEEP and DSG is about. That's what World Trade Center in Northern California is about. Take advantage of those resources. We also have Glenn Roberts from um, U.S. Commercial Service here. There's excellent resources throughout Northern California to help you be successful and stay out of trouble. Uh, another question. Um, if our clients are developing their in-house software, can you request an audit from CBP to make sure your software will be compliant? Well, um, you don't want to ask CBP for an audit. Uh, I, I know what you meant. You meant, can I just get a permission from them? Absolutely, yes. Uh, there's also a form where you can ask, um, uh, where you can inform customs that you're moving your record keeping electronic. Uh, and absolutely. And if you send me an email, uh, I'll just put my email again on the board. Uh, then, um, uh, you know, I, I might know which that software is and tell you my thoughts on whether it's compatible with custom system. And customs has also put a list of uh, ABI software providers on their website. I can show it to you. And if you select one from there, you're guaranteed that uh, you know, they comply with customs. All right. Well, with that, I think we have about two minutes left. We'll go ahead and uh, we will wrap up. Once again, I want to thank everybody for attending today. As I mentioned, uh, we will be sending out a slide deck, a copy of the recording, and a brief survey. Please take a couple minutes, fill out the survey. That helps us to know what we can do to provide better information and resources to help small businesses thrive in international business here in Northern California. I'd like to once again thank our funding partner, uh, the Northern California SBDC, they are the ones that really have supported us and are helping to make this possible. Once again, on October, I put it in the chat window, I think it's Tuesday, October 25th, we'll be doing a session 90 minute long on the fundamentals of international e-commerce. So if you've got any interest in learning more about how do you do international e-commerce on the marketplaces, how do you optimize your website, Please join us for that session. We'll have a gentleman named Patrick Perot from Canada, who is an expert on international e-commerce. With that, I would like to thank all of you for attending and also once again, thank Deep for presenting. My pleasure. Take care and have a fabulous rest of your day. Bye everyone. Thank you.